Uh, again, uh, if you want to call me, I just go by Alf. It's just easier. Uh, so what are we going to be talking today about? Today we are going to be talking about uh, unsupervised learning, uh, in the specific case about generative models. And for uh, starter, we are going to be talking about autoencoders. So let's see what this stuff is. Okay. All right, so again, you have seen this stuff so many times so far. Uh, so we have here a input on the bottom part. Then we have like an affine transformation. I have here my hidden representation. And on top, I'm going to have some other item. Before, we were calling the top part uh, white hat. Uh, but in unsupervised learning, we don't have the labels. So we only have, as I was saying on the first lesson, different kind of fruits. But the teacher, he went on a, uh, he went or she went on a strike. So she's not, she's not there. You had this poor kid trying to figure out things by its own. Um, so what are we going to be using here? So in, in this case here, we are going to be trying to reconstruct our initial input. And so we have same input here, the same input uh, here. I mean, we've tried to reconstruct the same input. So somehow in between, um, we are going to be basically uh, perhaps learning about a efficient representation if this guy here, the dimensionality of this one here, maybe it's smaller than this guy. So we had to, to somehow encode our information maybe in a smaller representation. But OK, so this is just the initial diagram. So yeah. Does that, so you're saying H has a dimension, dimensionalities lower than X? Oh, potentially, yeah. It could have like a lower dimensionality than X. So you have somehow to be smart in the way you encode this guy, because you have less way of representing this guy here. And then you try to get back to the same uh, input. I'm going to say more in a, a few slides. Don't, don't worry. Any example of such thing? Okay. You're going to see soon in a few slides. All right, so equations, they are all the same, right? So we have our hidden representation, which is the affine transformation of the input, uh, with, to which we apply a nonlinearity. And then we have, again, the our uh, estimation of our, again, input is going to be a fine transformation of our uh, hidden representation to which we apply a nonlinearity. Um, all right, so again, the input and the target, or the actually reconstruction, they both have the same dimensionality because it's the same thing. Uh, so this is why it's called autoencoder, because we are trying to encode its own input. Okay. The hidden representation is r to the d, where d is the dimension of my hidden space. Uh, the first guy here shoots in d starting from n, and the other guy shoots in n starting from d. Okay? So nothing, nothing new. Um, so here I introduce a new kind of representation. So in the, on the left-hand side, we have uh, here I represent with those circles different vectors. So here is my input vector, here is my hidden vector, and here is my output vector. Whereas my uh, lines here represent a affine transformation plus the application of the nonlinearity. Uh, in this case, instead, it's a block diagram, which is more, uh, it's used more, let's say, if you're, I mean, they, they represent different things. In this case here, the vectors represent my uh, vectors. Sorry, the arrows represent my vectors. So I have my input vector, uh, my hidden representation, and my output. And this guy here represents the process of actually uh, conversion between those different uh, units. So in this case, the affine transformation plus the nonlinearity. All right, so dual representation, right? Uh, arrows means something here. Arrows mean something else there. But they are basically, you can use either, either one. Uh, this is more of a notation for neural networks. This is more of a, a representation for signal processing, perhaps, of you know, when you want to apply some specific transformation to your signal. All right. So again, why would we be using this stuff here? Uh, because labels are expensive. Uh, someone has to uh, get some human involved in order to label every singular uh, example of perhaps some, some kind of, you know, some object uh, or some images. Uh, in this case here, we try to learn some kind of interesting representation without need of using these external labels. There is a paper just been released uh, this week, I think, oh, last week, from uh, Facebook um, AI, which is not fair, but it's a very nice paper. You can check about pre-training with unsupervised techniques. 
which is very uh, related to this topic. So, um, also we are going to be using these techniques whenever we have very few samples. And if you perform simply a supervised learning, we are going to be ending up overfitting the data set. So basically we are be, we're going to be learning by heart those uh, labels without actually understanding the overall structure of your data. Instead, if we pre-train those kernels, perhaps, of our convolutional neural net with an unsupervised technique, we just have those kernels being uh, learning those structure of the data, and then we can just use a few samples in order to train our last uh, classifier. All right, let's get more meat on the fire. So uh, sometimes you're going to see that uh, weights are tied. So this guy here is called encoder, and this guy is called decoder. And sometimes you have that the weights of the uh, encoder are equal to the decoder but transpose, right? Because you have uh, dn and nd. So why would you use tight weights, for example, in the two blocks? Say again? Whatever you put in, you're going to get the same thing back. Oh, but you have also a nonlinearity, oh, no. right? So, but why would you use this kind of relationship? How many parameters do you have if you apply this kind of uh, constraint? Half is less, right? So your optimization is actually going to be easier. You have less parameters to play with. All right, so let's go on. We are probably not arguments. Huh? We are going to some other argu arguments which uh, uses this property. But not arguments, then it should be less parameters. Say again. Less parameters, it's not argument. So it should be some other argument, because actually you are taking matrix, which should be transformed into each other. That's one of the households to each other. So it has some other mathematical properties. Okay. Which one? So why why we are using this approach? Uh, you if, tell me if you know. No, I don't know. That's okay. Why, but argument, then we need to use this to have less less parameters. It's not argument. Okay, then it's not argument. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so we can choose to have different kind of losses, for example, to train this uh, autoencoder. Um, at the beginning, we are going to be using this kind of capital L. Oh, sorry. This, we use this capital L here, which is the uh, average of all these per sample uh, losses, where we try again to reconstruct our input with our own prediction. Sorry, this should be a hat uh, design uh, symbol there. Um, so um, if you have different kind of data, you're going to be using different kind of uh, per, sample, uh, per sample loss. Uh, for example, if you have binary data, you'd like to use a binary cross-entropy, for example, which is the same thing we have seen uh, in the first lesson when we were trying to cl uh, classify those pixels as belonging to different spirals. That was a cross-entropy, which is the same as shown here, but for multiple classes. This is just basically the cross-entropy for uh, two different classes. Um, I would spend more time, but I I'd like to show you some examples later, so um, if there are no specific questions, I just uh, keep going for these uh, slides here. So this, this input here, I'm going to be using it for binary data. For example, I have images with our, which are uh, black and white, so binary. Uh, it could be like some uh, receptors. You're going to find out, oh, I have there a data, or oh, I don't have. Like, so there are uh, uh, like events. No, I get an event, or there are, there are no events. So I'm going to use this guy here, for example. Uh, uh, otherwise, if I have uh, real data, which are basically, I don't know, maybe the pixels, uh, the color of the pixel of an image, or any, uh, I don't know, audio signals, uh, then I'm going to use this kind of representation where I uh, compute the square norm, um, sorry, the, 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 the norm, the two norm of your, the distance of those two guys, right? The, squ the quadratic, the square of the distance between these uh, two guys. Uh, so this is going to be basically regression, and this is going to be basically classification, right? All right. Is it clear so far? All right. Okay. So we have a loss. We are going to we have our uh, input. Uh, so we have our input, which is going to be basically uh, the same as our target, and here we have our output prediction. All right. So as I was saying before, um, here is a is a mixed representation between. Uh, the two I showed before. Here I, I show with those uh, circles inside those blocks, like the size of the specific uh, encoder, decoder, and whatnot. Actually, no, these are actually the, my vectors, right? So in this case here, I have my input, for example, of dimension ID 3, and then I go up to some kind of smaller representation. 
and then I go back to the larger representation. And when I try here to match what I see here. Uh, so you can think about this kind of scheme as a condenser, right? So I have like a, let's say I'd like to load images on a computer faster, right? So I would like to find a smart way of compressing my image. So you can use neural network in order to compress data. Uh, and it's going to be squeezing out all the redundancy in your natural data, which, you know, uh, you ha it has those three uh, specific uh, statistics we have talked last time over and over. So um, going from here to here, we squeeze out all this extra unnecessary redundant information. And then when we expand back here, we try to restore whatever we have compressed here. Uh, yes? So if we tried to use like a standard data compression technique, um, then would that be counter to our overall goal, or we're just trying to find an alternative? Way to do that? That's a very good question. So uh, if you don't use any uh, nonlinearity here, this is becoming uh, basically PCA is a principal component analysis. <coughs> so if you start from three component to two, uh, by training this guy here. It's going to be converging to the same result you would get by applying PCA and basically a dimensionality reduction wherever you discard the uh, direction on which the data has less variance, right? Do you know PCA, right? Yeah, but even something like Huffman encoding. Right? Yes, okay. Uh, so Huffman encoding works on a specific uh, symbolization of your uh, data. This one works di directly with your input data, so it's going to find the best way of encoding. Uh, so half my encoding is expressed with uh, binary numbers, I guess. Uh, here you can have uh, much uh, uh, better compression because you just learn from your statistics the best representation in order to uh, squeeze out all that kind of redundancy. Yeah? It's different from that because Huffman encoding is lossless. And the point of this is to do a lossy compression. Uh, not quite. No? So. Oh, okay, uh, Asman, it is uh, lossless. I would argue that for a specific uh, dimension of this guy, this guy is still lossless. Um, well, for three, yeah. So you have 100% reconstruction. So it depends on what you're using. If you're using images, you can get to compress your image uh, with like 100% reconstruction here because it's just exploiting that kind of uh, unnecessary. Uh, representational power that images uh, have by, you know. For example, if we take a PNG, so it's lossless compression of images. So it's not a JPG. PNG is a lossless compression of images. But PNG is a Huffman encoding. PNG is actually zip. What? PNG is a Huffman encoding. It's actually zip. Yeah, but is, the, this this reminds me more of JPEG. I would say it's like a JPEG, but if you uh, if you are like in a lab, in a specific setup, you still retain all the information. Then, of course, if you start reducing even more, then you start having some lossy compression. But here, the point is that you can learn directly from your uh, input data the best way of representing the data uh, without you know a need of actually resorting to uh, specific algorithms, right? All right, so this is usually what I think about uh, when, I, when, I, uh, when I was thinking about autoencoders, you know, something that allows me to uh, re-encode my own input, uh, but using a smaller condensed representation. So uh, I usually also think about this one as a concept vector. So if I have here different words or sentences and I try to re-encode the same word or same sentence, uh, this kind of, so like if you're using the one hot encoding, um, Maybe this one, this representation for it gives you like a more condensed uh, concept about that one that is uh, taking a place in that long, long, long vector. All right. So, um, but then there are also the overcomplete. So, how, how how does this work? So, here we have a hidden state, internal state, which is larger the actual input. So you can actually. Um, say like, oh, this guy, since he has to just replicate this guy here, he can simply copy here, and then he copies it over here, right? So how come are we interested in something that is uh, over complete uh, for an autoencoder? Well, because it depends what you're actually sending here. So uh, in here, we still have to introduce some kind of constraint, which could be, for example, we turn some of these to zero. So we have a sparsity uh, constraint so that each of those uh, neurons here encode a specific uh, 
characteristic of your data. Or for example, we can have like, uh, we apply some noise here, and we try to reconstruct the initial image without the noise. So maybe we'd like to you know, implement a denoising autoencoder, which is learning how to get rid of external noise. And therefore, it's better to use a larger representation in the middle, because by having larger dimensionality, you can, as, I, as we have seen in the first lesson, push things around in an easier way. Uh, other things are, for example, you can use a contrastive autoencoder or a variational autoencoder where you have basically sampling from a distribution. So all those techniques, techniques are introducing some kind of constraint over the hidden representation. Although it is larger than the input, it has somehow some constraint over just copying over the information through. Okay? And this is also very, very useful. We are going to be seeing that very soon. All right, so uh, let's see, for example, uh, an example with a notebook. Do we have? Yes, we have some time. So let, let's train our first, uh, this guy here, a normal kind of encoding version of the, like a, a under complete, <coughs> under complete uh, autoencoder. So this stuff is on the uh, on the Git repo. You're gonna have to type this one, git reset hard origin master, in order to get the latest version on your machine. Uh, I'm gonna be using the uh, no. I'm gonna be using the what is it? Autoencoder number six. And so here I'm gonna be executing uh, some of these lines. And here you can see. Uh, we go from uh, 28 by 28, which is 784 dimension for representing one digit in the MNIST uh, dataset. We are going to be going, going down to 30 in dimensionality, okay? So this is going to be definitely a lossy compression of image. And then from 30, we are, we are, we are going to go back up to this large number. So I have executed that one. I get my optimizer, then I start training. And I display some results, okay? Uh, and here we have the reconstruction, I think. Um, so these are the reconstructed uh, images. And let me see. Image. Before, after, before, after. Yes, I'm showing you right now. Oh, sorry. There you go. So here you can see the before and after. So this is my input, which has been compressed down to the dimensionality, I think, 30. And then we get it back up to whatever dimensionality here. So we have a very, very, very strong compression. And then, of course, we, we're going to see there is a, a kind of bad reconstruction. So, so how? But again, we managed to compress all those different pixels into a very kind of small representation, which is sort of managing somehow to uh, reconstruct those kind of initial values. All right. So let me show you instead uh, the denoising autoencoder, how it works. Oops. So, um, in this case here, we uh, assume that we have our initial input, uh, but then again, we have our the, the input that we observe instead. It's kind of uh, it's not necessarily this one, but it's like a random variable uh, condition to the our observation. So here I represent the manifold of my uh, input data. So here, all those dots are examples of those digits. So we have, say, we have said those digits are 28 by 28, which are 700 something. And you can think about those digits as one point in this uh, very large dimensional space, right? And here, I'm showing you that all these points here, they just follow a sort of uh, lower space, lower, lower dimensional manifold. So they, those dots are not really sparse, sparsely distributed in the whole space, but they are like forming a sort of shape in this kind of space. Uh, so here we have our input x, 
and we are going to be corrupting our input with a specific noise. So we are, for example, adding some Gaussian noise. We are moving this input from the manifold outside to the manifold. So the task of the autoencoder is going to be just getting this guy back to the X. Okay? So the, the noise in autoencoder gets things that are outside the manifold and brings them down back here. So we assume that we, at the beginning, we have this guy here. We have the X, we perturb the X, and then we let the autoencoder remove that perturbation. And by performing this operation, we are going to be learning the statistics of our input manifold. Uh, so here we have a very strong assumption. We assume that the injecting, we are injecting the same noise distribution we are going to be uh, going to observe later on in reality. Uh, in this game, we can uh, learn how to be robust to that data. So if we observe noisy uh, input, we can learn, we can just apply this, 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 the noise in autoencoder in order to remove that extra noise that we have managed before uh, to learn, right? So here we are going to be learning this kind of uh, perturbation, and then we learn how to reverse those perturbations. So let's see how this works in the notebook. So in here, you should be scrolling a little bit up. And we are going to be changing. Instead of going to through 30, we are going to 500. Uh, yes, I understand that 500 is still less than 784. But I would assume this is actually over complete because um, 784 are way too many dimensions in order to just to express those uh, numbers of the uh, MNIST data set. So I would say that 500 is way more than would be what is the information content of those digits. So I'm reinitializing my uh, autoencoder, which now has a much larger uh, internal representation. I have my optimizer. And then here, in this cell here, I'm going to be activating this module, which is called dropout, which is dropping out some of my uh, pixels from the input. Then here, I'm uncommenting this line here. So I have my images bed, which are basically my input images, which are getting corrupted. Uh, here, I have my input, uh, which is going to be image bed, uh, which is going to be going through the model and generates the output. And then I have my loss, which is made between the output and the uh, not corrupted input. Finally, here, I'm going to show you the image bed versus my output. So now it's training. And so basically now we are going to see whether we are able to remove that external noise, that additional noise, and basically have learned a representation. So here we have the initial digits. These are, you can see maybe a 0, a 6, a 9, an 8. And then we have these uh, green dots, which are basically set to 0. So those guys here are set to zero, and the, I think the blue is minus one, the red, the yellow is plus one, or something like that. Um, so in here we have corrupted the, our input with, in this way. Has our autoencoder, the noise autoencoder, managed to disentangle this kind of noisy layer from our digit and then remove that noise from my data? What do you think? Yes. Yay. There you go, right? So you can see here, this has been really nicely restored from this initial corrupted input. So these are my inputs of my network. And the output of the network is just those very pretty images. So here we have learned how to be robust over this kind of over 50%, actually 50% of the pixels here have been turned to zero. And here the network managed to reconstruct half of the <coughs> missing image. So this, this can be also used, for example, for image in painting when there are regions of your image that are missing, for example. Like, or if you want to delete some part, so you have your image, you want to like to delete that uh, photo bomber, no photo, shoot, how do you call it? Photo bomber, right? The, the guy there. So you just draw black pixels there, you send it through my uh, denoising out encoder. Huh? You just told us that if we will draw some pixels, Algorithm will return back this eight, right? So if you will put this, this pixel on this face, you will pass through this one, and then this face will show up back. No. So if you put some black pixels, it's going to try to fill up with the background. 
and it's going to be removing the, uh, the guy who was trying to you know, ruin your photo. So let's see. Um, but, yeah. but if the loss function uh, x uh, is uh, the picture of before. Yes. Yeah. Before the, okay. That was for That's training. Important point. Okay. Yes, 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 of course. <laughs> so I train with the original image, which is not okay. perturbed, and I try to go back to the unperturbed image. But then you're just feeding noisy images, and you're going to get <coughs> cleaned up versions afterwards. Okay. All right, so I can show you some weights that has been learned. And you can see here, uh, these are, haven't been basically trained, but these kernels here, they are convolutional kernels, which are tuned to, pay, to, to resonate with some specific uh, curvature of your drawings of your digits. So those two you know, may extract something. And if you have a linear combination of these guys here, you can generate those uh, images. Um, so let's actually uh, check what OpenCV has, right? So OpenCV has in paint and uh, in paint NS and uh, Telea in order. So it's like Telea and Navier Strokes, Stokes uh, in painting techniques, techniques which are um, there for cleaning up your, your your data. So let's see how they work. So this one is my noise. Okay, so this is my half percent, fifty percent of the data corruption. These are my digits with corruption. These are the original digits. These are the results from my autoencoder, and these are the results from the other two techniques. Oh, <laughs> right. So right now, spending what, a few minutes, one minute of training, like even less, thirty seconds. We get results that are much better than state-of-the-art uh, algorithms that you know big people spend so much time in creating. We just made it from scratch by just learning it from data. Yeah. And the reason that it's better is because you trained on your own data. That's it, right? Okay. Yeah. This one is only working with the specific noise we have trained with the specific data we have used. If you apply to other techniques, it's not going to be that good. But if you can tailor tailor your algorithm to your data statistics. And we just have to reconstruct the manifold, right? That's it. All right. How much time do I have left? My God. I have 15 minutes, I guess. All right. Let's see if I can do some more stuff. We have like uh, much more stuff. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm going to be running so badly. All right. So uh, here we have the contractive autoencoder. What is this guy? So despite the uh, very scary name, uh, this is actually very easy to understand. So here we have again our input manifold, wherever, whereas our dots here represent the specific uh, data points of our uh, data set. And these ones are representing basically the surface or whatever these kind of objects in this high dimensional space where all my things are uh, laid. All right, so I have there my input sample. And then I have this reconstruction. So uh, what are we doing here? My reconstruction, it has a loss associated to the reconstruction term. And then there is this guy here. What is it? Renormalization. Hello. What is it? Renormalization. What is this symbol? OK, NABLA, sure. What does NABLA do, usually? Gradient of my hidden representation with respect to my input. So what does this say? Penalize it. If Penalize what? If the hidden representation is very far away from the very far away from the input. Uh, no. Penalize the weight. Large weight size. So this one is going to be penalizing the sensitivity to the x. So basically, if this is very, very good, if this is very strong, my uh, hidden layer is going to be completely insensitive of the uh, input. So whatever is going to be my input, my edge, edge is going to be always the same, right? So if this is very, very large, and if I try to minimize this loss, th th this means that I don't want to be sensitive to the input. Anything I send, I just put always the same constant, right? So it's, it is insensitive to noise in the input? So this is insensitive to anything. It's like, you're talking, I don't listen. <laughs> All right. So this is like, basically, I don't want to listen to anything that's happening over there. So I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like putting my, right. OK, so this doesn't work. I mean, it's just this one. And this one is like somehow trying to do something, right? So this is, this is trying to reconstruct, whereas this is trying to avoid any kind of variability of my hidden state 
with respect to every direction in the X. So how does it work? The first part penalizes insensitivity to the reconstruction. So in this case here, my X can move in this direction, right? So this guy here is penalizing uh, whether this guy here is not sensitive to variation in this direction. So this basically makes this guy respond to variation in this direction here. But this guy here penalizes sensitivity to any, of, uh, any, any other direction. So this one says, OK, this guy shouldn't be able to move anywhere. But this one says, OK, make, make it move towards this direction here. And so this is called the con uh, contractive uh, autoencoder where we avoid, uh, so if we are just uh, happening to just fall outside the manifold, that's actually bringing me back on the manifold. I go outside the manifold, that's like, ah, uh, back to the manifold. If I am on the manifold, everything's just fine, because there is my reconstruction term, which is say, life is good. All right, so this was the contractive autoencoder. Now we're going to be doing fancy things. Ready? I have five minutes now, 10 minutes, disaster. <laughs> All right. Yeah, penalize and incentivize in direction. Uh, and that's just the penalized direction. All right. Cool, huh? All right, that, that's my um, basic autoencoder. So what does it do on this stuff? Um, here we have all those samples that we observe in the data, right? So those balls are the samples. Now, as I said before, every digit can be thought as one dot in the 700 whatever dimensionality. And this is my one, one image, another image, another image, another image. And this is basically the, the path where only possible images, not possible natural images, uh, can occur. So I have my lowercase x, which belongs to this manifold, curly x, which is a subspace of Rn. So this guy is my example, and this guy is the manifold. On the other side, what do we have? So the point of using autoencoders is that, oh, how many dimension, dimensions do I need in order to represent this guy here? Although we are in three dimensions here, you can think, I get this one, I do that. How much do you need? One. Just one dimension, right? So that's what the autoencoder does. We just get one dimension, although three were used there in the representation. And I say, all right, so I have my uh, Z, which is my hidden representation. It lives on this manifold here, which is uh, under uh, subspace of this guy here. Um, and I get my first element here. I get the first set, last one there. And I just do stretched, right? All right, sweet, very cool. All right, this is basically what the autoencoder does. Now, how can we go back that direction, meaning, um, how can I get here a sample and then try to go on the other side? H how can I choose samples? So if I would like to sample from here, like using a, a non-parametric uh, sampling, so I have or to learn the uh, distribution of those dots here, just to see where they are uh, usually uh, happening to be, or I have to enforce here some structure so that I can, uh, I know what is the structure, then I just sample from that uh, distribution. Yeah. What if it's not a unique function? Like, what if there are loops? Where? Like, in, in this curve here, you've drawn, like, a straight line. But what if it, like, what if it's not unique? So these are, I'm just showing you three dimensionality and one dimensionality. This stuff, we said is 700 dimensions. And this stuff is maybe 30 dimensions. So loops and things are taken care of by uh, the larger dimensionality. Okay. All right, so I really have to rush now, sorry. So autoencoder recaps. So we have here the uh, neurons. We said the affine transformation. And here we can show those as the, uh, those blocks, encoder, decoder. So uh, variational autoencoder. I, someone yesterday told me, I spent the whole last month trying to study those variational autoencoders. Wow. I mean, uh, I even read the article. I, I didn't. It's too hard. I cannot understand. It's so complicated. So I try now to explain variational autoencoder in one minute. Maybe I can do a better job than, I don't know, someone else. All right, so let's start. We have, these guys are my classical autoencoder. We have an encoder here. We have a decoder over here. Variation autoencoder. We have an encoder over here and a decoder over there. Same, right? Nothing changed. Second step. Oh, okay. 
I'm outputting two things here. I'm outputting some uh, means, and then I'm outputting some distribution, some some variances. These maybe are like uh, diagonal matrix, so they are all uh, independent. Um, all right. So then here I just sample. So here I output these guys here, and then given that I have a mean and then I have a variance. I can sample one of those Zs here and use those Z to reconstruct my X. So it is like basically having here my encoder, which is ending up with those two guys here. And here I sum a noise. So I, I go to the representation. Oh, I get some noise. I, I get kind of off the representation. But then my decoder tries to get me back on the manifold, right? So this one is basically, instead of adding noise to the input, so I, I was in the input, I get outside the input, then I go the latent space, and then I go try to go back to the input. In this case here, I add the noise to the latent representation, but then again, I try to get back to the same point where I started, okay? All right, so, and there, what did we do? Well, this one can be thought as a variational autoencoder without the uh, variance part, right? So this is just outputting the mean. So this one gives me input, a value, and I reconstruct this guy. This guy instead, from here, I can think here, I basically uh, manage to get a sort of distribution, and then from the distribution I do a sampling, and then I go back up there, yeah? You just append this B of Z to the, to the latent representation, right? Say again, sorry? You're just appending these random bits to the latent representation. So if here I have D items, yeah. here I have two D items. Right. I have where, twice where as half many. Half of them are the same, you know, are the same D from there, of and the, half yes. of them are just random numbers. Yes, we start expressing how much those specific characteristics are further away from uh, that specific uh, point. So you have, if you have D different uh, explainator of your input, it, uh, the variation, the, the variance, it tells you uh, how much is the uh, uncertainty over that specific value. So here you just have, okay, my input can be expressed with a few uh, values. And here I tell you, oh, my input can also be expressed by those few values, but I also tell you how certain I am over each of those uh, four, perhaps, uh, characteristics. So you're saying x is larger on the left? Both x's are the same. Okay. This one, let's say we start from 100 and we go to 4. Mm -hmm. But in this case here, I know how much is each of those four, uh, how much is the uncertainty associated to each of those four uh, characteristics. Here, it's, you don't know how far you are in guessing the correct code. Here you have also this notion on telling, which is telling you uh, how certain you are uh, about a specific feature. Uh, we really are running out of time. All right, so let's see what it does. So the encoder maps from the input to the x, and we have said that this guy here is twice the dimension because we have the means and the uh, variance. And the other guy goes from, he samples from the latent variables uh, space, and it gets back to, the, uh, to my uh, prediction. All right, so variation of the encoder in drawings. So we start there with an initial sample. We go down here. And then from here, we actually add some noise in the encoding part. So we start encoding, but then you get somehow pushed away. In here, we go back over there by sampling. And then we try to get this guy here to be very close to the initial guy, right? So potentially, if we didn't have the uh, additional noise, we could be basically going here. But then here, every time we get new noise, so every time you get to point somewhere else. And by training this guy, you get to reduce this to, uh, this to the, distance, the distance between those two guys. And you become insensitive to this guy, this noise. Uh, something else. What we also like to do here is to be uh, basically invariant to this kind of distribution. So um, we can also enforce here this guy here, which is a loss associated to the distribution that those guys here should assume. In this specific case here, I'm saying, oh, the distribution of these Zs, those latent variables, should follow a normal distribution. 
so that I can easily sample from here and I get a meaningful uh, example of over, over there. So in this way, basically, I try to remove the association between this guy here and the guy who generated it so that I can basically have a nice distribution from which I can sample and then have a nice generative model. All right, a few slides more because I think you're interested in this one. Are you? Sorry for not taking too many questions, but I have like one minute. All right, generative adversarial networks in one minute. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, seriously. But tomorrow we have more stuff coming, so or this way or this way. Uh, we have, uh, so the next notebook on the, on the, um, on the GitHub page is going to be simply running that variation autoencoder, which allows you also to do very, something very nice. So you're going to have one point here, one point here, and then you can just move that point from one location to the other. You're going to be seeing how interpolation in the latent space is going to be uh, corresponding, corresponding to interpolation actually in the input space. So you're going to see basically having mathematical operation performed in the latent space, in the hidden space, corresponds to basically different shapes interpolating to different images. So you can go from like your face and your girlfriend face or boyfriend face by just interpolating those latent variables corresponding first one your face and the other one is your girlfriend face. And you're going to have very weird faces in between. Uh, all right. Not that you're weird, but you know. All right. All right, so one minute, then. <laughs> one minute, Bob, run. All right, thank you. I won't run, but I, I, don't stop me, because, well, stop me later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you understood this one, right, more or less. Instead of having just the E's here, I have twice as many guys, so I have also the uh, uncertainty associated to each of those uh, elements. So variational encoder, right? Generative adversarial networks. Actually, they are almost the same. I mean, very similar. All right, so we have similar colors. So we have a sampler here. Sampler, same, same sampler as here. This sampler was getting information from here. So there is some information coming from our input. Here, there is no input. So this is unconditional. This guy is sort of is conditioned to whatever we have uh, seen down here. So we have a generator, same color of the decoder. <coughs> Same. Uh, here I have my x hat. I have my x hat. I guess it's the same. So so far we have same modules, right? All right. Next one, x. There. Okay. Everything the same so far. Oh, what is it? It's a switch. Uh, discriminator. Hmm. So what is this stuff? So we have a generator which is basically getting some noise and is trying to generate something cool. And here we have another X, which are, these two guys are not related. Then we have a discriminator here, which is just trying to say, huh, is my input coming from real data or is my input coming from fake data? So this guy task is to discriminate between fake input and true input. At the beginning, it's going to be very easy because this is just randomly initialized. So this guy's uh, job is very easy. You're going to see trash here and good things here. Uh, the nice point is that this guy is going to provide me gradients through. So I can improve this, this guy's performance by seeing what are the actual meaningful information this guy used in order to tell me that this is fake and this is real. So this guy here, when he gets the job done of telling these two apart, is going to provide me. It's like a spy. It's, it's going to tell me, ha, ah, you made a mistake. OK, what is the mistake? That one, OK, let me fix. So this one is actually trying to fix the mistakes this guy tells it by using simply a gradient signal. Um, and so overall, when you train this guy, this guy is going to be improving, improving, improving its own performance. And it's going to be converging to just produce outputs which are looking exactly the same as the data from our input distribution. So they are basically un uh, undistinguishable. And this guy here, best, best job is going to be just being guessing uh, one half, no, 50%, which one is the real data and which one is the fake data. The point here is that we don't have any conditionality on the input. So these are just generating uh, like 
very real look, real looking data without actually having having never observed real data. Uh, this guy here instead generates, you know, real data, but it has some knowledge of whatever uh, is in the input, and that's why we had to enforce that kind of uh, normality, no, over here with that KL divergence loss. All right, one more. All right. So the generator maps from the hidden space to the uh, input space from, from Z to X hat. And the other one goes from the or X or X, this one, to my binary uh, output, which is going to be or 0 or 1. Like uh, it's, it's correct. It's like true. It's coming from the, uh, it's coming to the real data. or it's coming from the fake data. So finally, how does it work with the graphics? So. First one, we have our input. Remember, in the out variation out encoder, we were starting from our input data. We were going here, and then we were going back. Here, we don't have the input uh, involved. We just start random noise. From the input, random noise, we get the generator, and we say, ha, this is my guy here. And then we have the discriminator saying, hmm, I think it's fake. So this guy. It's going to tell this guy why he thinks it's fake, and this guy is going to try to improve the shooting in order to shoot on the manifold. Then also the discriminator is going to get some other input, and it's going to say, huh, this is going to be a good value, right? So this guy is trained across with using these samples and these samples, and this guy here just tries to shoot on the manifold. And finally, the way you train this guy is just using a min-max uh, game over this value function, which is basically one is trying to fool the other. The generator tries to fool the uh, the generator tries to fool the discriminator, and then you have just here the discriminator trying to do a good job in classifying the real data. So again, this is going to be a minimax game over this value function. I know it was a lot of stuff, but the whole point of this stuff here was to tell you that once you train this guy here, you end up with two different things. First one is going to be a very awesome generator, which goes from random noise, like a vector of phi elements, Gaussian, uh, like white noise, phi, phi elements. And that one is going to be generating absolutely gorgeous pictures of your you know, model, whatever you train the thing on. They really train on bad things. Uh, okay, Don't check bad things. Uh, <laughs> seriously. Uh, the other one, so this is the, one of the things, right? Why do you use a, a, a generative adversarial network? Generative, no? Why is generative? Because you have an absolutely amazing generator. But what do you have here, too? A discriminator, right? What does it do, this one? It's absolutely super well trained in telling apart data that stays on the manifold versus data that is not on the manifold. So some of you yesterday asked me, oh, how do I train a classifier in order to find anomaly detection? Right? This way. So you get this discriminator just learning very, very well what is your input data uh, manifold. And therefore, if you have some outlier, ha, it's going to catch it. It's like, ha, it's fake data, right? So don't, don't forget that whenever you train these guys, you don't get just the generator, which is why people mostly train these generative adversarial networks. But you get also a very, very, very nice discriminator for free, right? All right. Sorry for running so much. You have the other examples on GitHub. And I see you, I guess, tomorrow for uh, sequence learning with Recurrent Neural Network and Elestia. Thank you for listening.